Søren Kierkegaard studied philosophy at the University of Copenhagen in the, in the 1830s, and he doesn't seem to have enjoyed it much. Uh, he wrote a, a short novel, and he never finished it, but he started a, a short novel which described his experience. It's called Johannes Climacus, and it tells the story of a boy just like him who, as a little boy, fell in love, not with a girl, but with thinking, with the experience of thinking. He just loved finding out that he could just mull things over and get clearer about things just by thinking things over. And he didn't really know whether anybody in the entire history of the world had done anything like this, taken such pleasure in their own intellectual activity. He says he, he felt how wonderful it was to wake up in the morning and find that his my, entire mind is covered with new thoughts like freshly fallen snow. One day, Johannes overhears some philosophy students chatting together, and he's absolutely astonished that these students seem to be doing in a professional and disciplined way what he's been doing as a private amateur. And what he notices they're always talking about, they're always talking about doubt. They say philosophy begins with doubt, or in order to philosophize, you must have doubted everything. And Johannes says to himself, well, my goodness, what, what would it mean to doubt everything? Have these students actually put themselves through this experience of doubting everything? It must be the most... How can anybody doubt everything and come back to tell the tale? You'd have thought they might die of the shock, or if they don't die of the shock, that they would be just rendered absolutely dumb by the horror of doubting everything. Johannes then stops daydreaming and goes back to the philosophy students who are still chattering about doubt, and he realises that there's something completely phony about them. They, they haven't tried to sail off into the eye of the storm of doubt. They haven't even dreamed of it. They haven't even dreamed of leaving the terra firma of common sense and their philosophy course at the university. They haven't allowed themselves to be the slightest bit perturbed by this universal doubt that they talk about so freely. And it, he starts to think that maybe they're a bit like many Christians are, that they think that sometime long ago some philosopher doubted for all of them so that they don't need to doubt anymore, just as Christians think that Christ suffered and died for them so they don't have to bother either. Johannes is desperately disappointed. When Johannes grows up and goes to university in his turn, he begins to see what the problem is. The problem is that philosophy students at the university are taught to believe that philosophy is just about complete. And all this stuff about doubting everything is for losers. It's for people who don't know that there are now books on the history of philosophy which assign every one of the great dead philosophers to their place in the development of philosophy and which show how we in the modern enlightened age are just about capable of understanding everything and that all we need to do is just sort out one or two details and then philosophy will be complete. So much for Kierkegaard's fictionalised version of his philosophical education. In reality, he graduated from Copenhagen after 11 years as a student with a thesis on the concept of irony. And in some ways, it's a very conventional academic thesis. But it does have a very important polemical point, which is that we need to go back to Socrates and to remember that the great thing about Socrates, Socrates was the teacher of Plato and what made him such a great teacher was that he knew that his task was not to discover the truth and then communicate it to his students. On the contrary, even if he knew the truth, he shouldn't just tell it to his students because that would turn them into slaves. The task of the teacher is to open questions for the students and to make sure that they stay open. Kierkegaard's writing life was incredibly short, at only 14 years. He died in 1855 at the age of 42, but in, the, in that very short period, he produced an astonishing body of work. There's notebooks and diaries that fill 12 huge volumes. And on top of that, he published 34 books. Uh, and most authors, you talk about the year in which a particular book was published. In the case of Kierkegaard, you have to say the date, because he sometimes published more than one book in a, in a month. And one of the extraordinary things about these books is that nearly all of them are written under the names of 
pseudonyms. He doesn't use his own name. That's not the, I mean, people knew that they were really the work of Kierkegaard, but it enabled him to uh, dramatise his use of Socratic irony. He didn't want to have any voice of authority permeating his works. And so he says, oh, well, this one is by Johannes the Silent, this is by Johannes Climacus, this is by Hilarius Bookbinder, the whole lot of... And then he gets these pseudonyms to argue with each other, to put each other down, and then some of them start talking about this upstart called Søren Kierkegaard, who seems to think that he's an author too. And, and so, I mean, it's, it's quite amusing, but it also does make the very serious point that the last thing you should do is to turn to anybody as an authority who can tell you what you ought to think. You have to do it for yourself. Printers loved him because he was extremely precise. He sent them very good, sent, did all the proofs, and it was all, you know, it was all incredibly well worked out. It wasn't, it wasn't just someone who blurted it all out. They're beautifully structured. I don't know. Well, anyway. That's because <laughs> he, he foresaw everything else, right? Mm. Yes, that's well. I guess so, but but but, but uh, well, maybe. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but there are other of us who haven't had much of a life that we don't manage to write. <laughs> 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 yeah.